All right, so here we go. We are always talking to women making their mark in STEM, and that is science, technology, engineering, and math. On today, we have Dr. Betty Booker, who is a senior scientist in the new technology group at Advanced Cell Diagnostics, an RNA in situ biotechnology company in Fremont, California. Dr. Booker is a member of the bioinformatics team, which develops RNA molecules to target biomarkers in research and clinical samples. Dr. Booker, welcome to the podcast. So happy to have you here. Um, so now in my intro, it was a mouthful. And I know you all heard it loud mates and I'm quite sure Dr. Booker uh, will be able to help us. So before we even get started on her career path, I just want you to tell the lab mates a couple of terms that I know I use that they may not be familiar with, and that is RNA in situ and biomarkers. Can you kind of explain, if you can, in layman terms, what that might mean? So yeah, sure. So thank you for having me, and I'll for sure be able to give you just a brief kind of in layman terms of what our company does using maybe in C2 and also biomarkers. So for in C2, this is a, a traditionally um, a way for us to look at nucleic acids in, in a state. So if you're interested in looking at nucleic acids, maybe in the nucleus or in a cell, the cytoplasm or in tissues, you can do that with uh, in situ hybridization assays. So essentially you're making a complementary uh, DNA or RNA molecule to bind to a particular region of interest. And with that region of interest, that's usually dependent upon uh, what you're interested in. So for instance, if you're interested in a biomarker that is specific maybe for a certain type of cancer, you can make an actual DNA or RNA complementary nucleic acid to identify that biomarker. A really popular biomarker would be like BRCA1 or BRCA2. So we make different biomarkers um, based on that. Uh, what the need of the actual client or customer, and it, it spans from either cancer biomarkers, viral targets, anything you can imagine, any species, any type of cell, any type of gene, we can make a biomarker target for that particular um, instance. Thank you. So lab mates, I hope you all heard that and understand. If not, you should really go back to starting with DNA, RNA, and proteins. That's where I always start us off on the central dogma. So yeah. that will help you then. You can kind of work your way into where Dr. Booker is right now. So we know, Dr. Booker, that you are a senior scientist uh, at Advanced Cell Diagnostic. And so you can tell us a little bit about your career and what do you do there? So thanks again. So I think as I just mentioned about the biomarkers, I'm a big part of the bioinformatics team. And so we're responsible for making different molecules based on the needs of our customers and clients. And so if you think about all, let's just take, for instance, the human genome, you have about 20,000 genes in the human genome. So even though the genome came out in about 2001, I think, um, and it's constantly being updated here and there with different annotations, but the genes came out, but now a lot of scientists are interested in knowing what each gene is doing or the functionality of a gene. And so more specifically, when you're doing research, maybe you're trying to solve a problem. And if you have a particular gene of interest, you want to identify that gene. You want to know where, where it is located in the cell or tissue population. You want to know how it's expressed, right? So a lot of molecule processes may use uh, qPCR, RT-PCR to look at quantitative analysis of a certain gene because you want to know if it's expressed highly, lowly, something uh, in, in accordance to your research. But then you also want to know more specifically in what our technology provides is how this gene is located and where it's located in, in pertaining to its function. So if you know that your gene is high, high is a high expressor. So let's check out what type of cells your gene is actually located in. A lot of times it's done with facts sorting, right? Or facts analysis. But with us, we can take all of that. We can tell you, we can give you this qualitative uh, expression analysis, which you can link back to your quantitative analysis, and then we also can give you morphological context, which then you can say, hey, it's high, highly expressed in cell type A, but not, not as expressed in cell type B. So what does it tell me about my problem? And so for the bioinformatics team, what we do is we identify different targets based on the customer and um, design those targets for biomarker analysis in our assays. So we have tons of different type of assays. If you want to look at um, uh, point mutations, we can do point mutations for you. We can look at exon junctions, fusions. We can look at uh, intronic 
RNA, we can look at mature RNA. So it just depends on the needs of the customer, but for the most part, we're RNA product and we target gene essentially profiles to see what's happening on the gene level. So and tell me, um, in your career in doing this, did you start out uh, with the company in this particular group or did you move around? How did you find your niche? I would say. Yeah, that's a good, good question. So yeah, I, so I started this company after I finished my postdoc at UCSF and I was in a genomics group at UCSF. And so after finishing my postdoc, I started this company as an application scientist in R&D. And so my main goal for that was doing a lot of analysis of biomarker targets as an application scientist. Okay. And then as our company grew, so in about maybe I would say seven or eight months, our company grew exponentially exponentially. So the company asked if I would be interested in going back to do some things that I did as a postdoc. And I was like, oh, well, I kind of want to break away from that. Um, and so the, the chief scientific officer asked if I would be interested in joining his group. And when, when they ask, you say yes. And so I just say yes. <laughs> so I complied <laughs> and I um, joined the bioinformatics team on that side. At that time, it was only two people on the team. I was the second person hired as a uh, bioinformatics scientist. And so I was really excited about it because I had some experience just with a lot of the genomic um, work that I did in my UCSF postdoc. So it was fun. Did that for about seven, eight months. And then I joined the bioinformatics team. And I've been here, I think, for now three years with the bioinformatics team. Well, it's good to know that the things that you did in graduate school end up helping you <laughs> when you got out here. Because, you know, sometimes you're always like, is this ever, you know, when you sit at a bench and do the same essays over and over, you're like, am I ever going to end up doing this for real? Because, exactly. yeah. Or just know how to apply it, right? It's like we learn right. so much. It's like, at what point can I really use this information and really use my skills to maybe even make them better or also uh, help someone else use them? So, yeah, I was concerned about that. And that's why I didn't want to go back to doing some of the same things. But now it, I, I use it in a completely different way. Um, it's yeah. very targeted on what the customer needs. So I don't have to go do research for it. They're doing the research. <laughs> that's a good part. And so... Right. That's the fun part is seeing what everyone is doing. Anything that's on the, you know, breaking uh, line of research, I know what's happening because our clients are all over the world. They work in different type of um, research development offices or mm -hmm. academic offices, biopharma, biotech, anything you can imagine. Government agencies, those are our main, uh, main, main customers. So, mm -hmm. I mean... We work with so many different types of researchers that we get to see what's happening. And a lot of times we know what's, what's going on early. Well, since you mentioned it, one of my big things was, as I follow you on your social media, I saw you put up a picture that said your team had been um, uh, shown as one of those that were working on the coronavirus, or I guess highlighted in the newsletter for the company. And I was like, oh, black girl magic all the way, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, look at Betty, she's working on the coronavirus. And at the time, it was just the coronavirus and that COVID-19, get in your house and, say, <laughs> and isolate yourself from everybody. Uh, and so I was just so proud and so happy for you because I was like, look at that. I was like, people never think, you know, we're in the lab, you know, all those years working that we'll be working on something that really could help the world. And so I know you can't tell us much because y'all she's a secret agent i think <laughs> in her other life but if you can how would you use your in situ rna uh to actually help with this pandemic of the coronavirus so that's a great question and i think the the main thing that we work on because we work on the nucleic acids specifically rna we worked on the comparative analysis of the coronaviruses. So how is it different from all the other coronaviruses that are out there, right? So you know you have tons, you have the SARS family essentially. And so what our team was able to do was elucidate um, the spike protein and show that, hey, if we target the spike protein for detection, we can actually um, uh, isolate detection of the novel coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2. Um, virus. And so we looked at the particular nucleic acids and that's what we do daily. We analyze 
at the nucleic acids, DNA and RNA all day. And so we were able to identify that particular region that was best to target with our molecule. And so now we can sell that particular molecule to tons of different customers in the United States and in China uh, and all over the world essentially. And so we're able to sell that and they're able to use it to identify cases of, um, with, with patients and also with, cut, with research samples to say, hey, this, this patient or this research sample does have um, coronavirus infection, the novel coronavirus infection that they're looking for and does not have the infection from the other coronaviruses. That's really important for clinical cases, especially because yeah. you don't want to misidentify the actual coronavirus um, as the potential, you know, um, infectious agent if you're not completely sure. So our team uses a lot of comparative analysis and genomics to, to do that. And this is just one of the cases that we were working on really early. So we probably started working on uh, a lot of molecule design probably in January of 2020. And so we really tried to get on the front line early with a lot of the needs of our customers too. That is so awesome. One of the things that I really um, like is that <laughs> you're telling the public that there are more than one type of coronavirus. And I just said to my students, I was like, we had the SARS scare and what people didn't realize or didn't know that the scientific name of this COVID-19 was SARS-CoV-2. And I was like, it's just SARS-Coronavirus-2. Yeah. And you know, we're now giving it this what I call media name of COVID-19. But um, I just like the fact that you're able to sit here and say that the coronavirus has been around. It is not anything new. It's not something, because you know, the conspiracy theories have come out. It was like, oh, it's man-made. They said they, 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 they like bottles. They're like, coronavirus has been here. And it's like, it's a different strain. And every time okay. somebody says that it's on the back of the Lysol, I'm like, oh, Lord. And this is what I think we're really important, especially in our community, to actually have the knowledge and be able to say, hey, let me just tell you really. You know, I had to tell people, I was like, mm. so let me just say I've been lecturing on coronavirus since 2009. <laughs> since okay. I started my <laughs> So let me just say that. And so, you know, people are like, oh, really? It's like, yeah, they didn't just make this up and put it out there. So yeah, I saw a lot of the conspiracy theorists. Everyone was saying, this is old. This is not new. And I'm like, yeah, but you guys know the mutations happen and viruses adapt. That's the whole point of evolution. That's how we've been able to have this coexistence for a very long time. <laughs> they adapt, we adapt, they adapt more, and we adapt a little, you know. Um, so well, I think like when I was explaining this to somebody, I was like, I hate to be, you know, geeky about this, but the virus is just doing what it's supposed to do. It was like, oh, I couldn't survive like that. So I had to mutate to survive like this. And I was like, it came back and we were like, we don't know who you are. And, you know, I was like, now our body has to adjust to the new one and get all of the antibodies together so it can fight it. But for now, the virus is not trying to, it's not trying to do anything but live. Really? Right, right. That's it. I know. And I know people hate him. And I hate <laughs> the same thing we do. <laughs> it sounds like I'm on the side of the virus, but I keep I telling know. we've been living on petri dishes for a while. I always say, I think the bacteria are just watching us, not us watching them. Bacterial gods, yeah. <laughs> I know, right? I swear, look, they ruled the earth before we got here. I was like, have y'all never? And I always go back to RNA world. Like, really? Oh, is that is that Andy Ball? <laughs> yes! <laughs> You I already love know. One of my favorite lectures ever. I know. He really just made me rethink everything. It was like, yeah. what? Yeah. It was so, And I think that's what I, I think sometimes that is missed in, I think, just community science is that we're not providing people with just simple answers about what they need to know. We're not scientific advisors in any case or health advisors, but just simple science literature, simple science. Right hey, what does this mean? What is the outcome? What is the output? What should I take home from this? And I think that's what's missing. So that's why I really appreciate something like this, where we can talk about just science in layman terms, and also just get, get more information out. Not saying that we, not proclaiming that we are the experts at anything, any one thing at that. Right. Um, but I think it's just good to just be able to have conversations about science and what's happening in our communities and what's happening in science too, the things that we love, you know. 
Right. I had to tell my students, I was like, <clears throat> you all understand a virus. We just had this lecture, chapter five. Hey. And so everything that I taught you about a virus, it's the same thing that's going on with this one. We talked about entry and exit portals and all the things viruses bring with them in order to survive the game because I make it a game. And so they're just trying to survive your body. So they have all of these things so that you don't produce mucus. So they are not captured and they can make it through. And so we just talked about all of those and I was like, so it's nothing different. Don't let it scare you. You have the knowledge, share that knowledge with your family so that they are not in a panic. And just let us know, this is why we always say, if it's a virus, it has to run its course. And it's because your body has to do its part, get the antibodies together, remember the immune system, we gotta get those T cells ready to fight it. B cells have to have the antibodies and we'll be fine. We just have to run the course. Exactly, and, I think that's a know, great way to put it. It's like holistically, hey, what, what's happening? What's the viral cycle? How does it affect us? How do we fight back? What's our immunity looking like? I think, and I think that's what we need. We need more just basic. Why does this matter? Why do, why do we care about this virus? Why didn't we care about Ebola? I have had, I've seen that so often. I'm like, wait, you guys, let's just come back. We cared about Ebola, but it was really not affecting us as much as it affected under-industrialized or places that didn't have the public health infrastructure, right? Right. And they so, did. And I don't even want to get on because I yeah, really like you both. Because I mean, you know, the, yeah. So that was a fun one too. And that's what I always say. I was like, I know everybody's like, why do you think this stuff is so fun? And people are dying. It's like, oh, just because the science is really doing its job. And so it's yeah. wonderful to see it in action to me. But okay, I'll go away. And something so novel that we're here to witness too, right? It's like, oops, I know. you know. I mean, I mean, at one yeah. point we will say at some period, because I and I hate to take it back to something so more, but the day 9-11 happened was the day that I was defending my um yeah, so my dissertation, whatever, uh what is it that we do? Your committee, your committee, yeah, oral pre your oral well, no, right. it was like our oral comps. I forget oral comps, name yeah. is. Right. But it was that day. And I remember seeing everything. And so, you know, because that is in my memory, I said one day my kids will look back and remember, oh, you remember when it was the COVID-19 pandemic? You know, so that's the thing that they they have lived through. And we will, you know, be old talking about, yeah, I remember when that happened. You know, and then I'll say, and my girl Betty was working on it. <laughs> That's how I'll talk about it. Well, but it is, or, or helping the scientists work on some stuff, yeah. Yeah, you working on it, girl. Let's take all credit. <laughs> I'm going to give it to you either way. Uh, but it's good to just see how your career has come around uh, because most, I think, students who may be uh, in elementary, middle school, high school, or even college, can't even imagine that they could end up being where you are working on something so novel that is so in real time right now. I think when, you know, kids are young, you know, we just think about, oh, I'm going to just be, if you like science, a doctor. And we're not sure about all the pathways for that. And so as we, as I talk about the pathways, I'm going to segue us on over to our second segment of this conversation, which is your journey. And in this segment, I just want you to um, start me at the point in your life when you realize that you really like science and how you navigated your pathway to now. Okay. So I, I don't, I get this question quite often and I try to write it down sometimes so I can make sure I think about it, okay. but I can't identify this one point or whether it was when I was eight or 10, but I remember doing a, I think it was fifth grade science fair and it was called um, Witch Fert Works. Oh. Basically, <laughs> I compared miracle Grow to cow manure and how it would grow different plants. Earth fertilizer, <laughs> thank you. I was like, what? Yes. <laughs> Got it. So, and, and I had cows plastered all over my, my poster board. So, um, and I tested that. And so I, te I think it was maybe a six week project and I just tested to see which one grew faster and which one grew longer, higher. Okay. Uh, simple parameters to look at as a fifth grader. And so I think I realized it then that I cared if I won, if I lost. I think I came in like maybe first place because then I went to regionals. Um, and this girl also had one beside me. I think at regionals is like, is OJ the juice? This is how old I am. <laughs> 
how young you are. <laughs> we all had catchy themes, right? But I, I really, I really wanted to um, understand it more. And so from that point, I think I started really taking things a little bit more serious. So by the time I was in my freshman year in high school, I was taking classes more dedicated to like um, science. So I may have taken like honors, biology or something. Um, and just being more, now, I'm not going to say into it because I felt like I was into all, everything at the time. I think I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be a policewoman. Girl, May Jemison had us all going to space. Girl, Let me girl. Just say. And I probably would have done that if I would have known I had to go to space. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so I just, I, I was really attentive to things and I really cared about outcome. And so I can recall the time when my mom would cook and I was always in the kitchen. Okay. I was trying to get scraps. I was like, Hey, what are you cooking? Okay. But I would always pay attention to how she cooked and how she was putting things together. And if she was missing something, what that meant about the recipe and what that meant about whether the bread would rise right. All right. And so, so this is going to sound completely um, middle of the hush science that I had in me. So I would take, I don't know if you guys know when the bowl is, you finish scraping out a bowl for a cake or cornbread, the little bit of drippings that's left. I had play plates and play pans. And so I would take the drippings and make my own, like in these mini, mini pans and set it out on the windowsill and see if it would make bread and cake at the same time. Okay. So clearly I wasn't aware of the temperature differences in the stove and in, on my windowsill. That's right. But I wanted to emulate that in some sort of way. And I knew that that was like some of my first identifiers of um, science, of experimental right. kind curiosity. of approach. Right. And that that's kind of like, I think, where I started. It, I was always in the kitchen just watching my mom cook. She had seven kids, so always watching her cook. And from there, I think that kind of made me think more about what things could change and what things could stay the same with experiments. And I think that kind of started me on that track. Um, I don't think she cared about the science part. <laughs> I think she really cared about the food, <laughs> and I did too. Um, but it was just things like that really caught my attention very early. So um, from there, I think that that really helped me kind of focus on science in, in high school and okay. they're kind of focused on maybe doing some programs during the summers, doing a lot of those, you know, camp this, camp that to just to kind of keep me interested over the summers too. So, you know, I work with STEM girl, uh, yeah. girl power STEM camp sometimes in the summer. Uh, yeah. And so when you say that uh, for a young lady listening here, like how did you find out about camps? Did they tell it in your schools or did someone in the community tell you? How do you, how do you remember being so, told well, about them? So a lot, because my mom didn't go to college and so my dad didn't go to college either. And so mm -hmm. Um, I have an aunt who was really instrumental in looking at different things for her nieces and nephews, just what we were interested in. She knew I was interested in science. So she had her ear to the pavement. She was on everybody's website. And, you know, websites were, were not that well, um, I guess, inundated with information at the time. But mm -hmm. she was looking for things on web, on the web and also by a hearsay as well. Because at the time, you know, we, we still relied heavily on academic bulletins, on right. bulletins in place at schools, letting us know what the opportunities were. And so she worked really hard to make sure every summer I had something to do in science. Every summer was a science opportunity. I would have maybe a couple of weeks off, but for the most part, I was always in some science. And um, yeah, I think that was probably what kept me in science. It's just having that network of people that I was working with every summer. It was different people every summer, but just having, building up a network of people and also seeing how so many brilliant scientists thought, I think that really helped me too, because it helped me kind of become more, as an adult, more sure of myself too, because I, I kind of interacted with so many different types of scientists. You said so much there. One of the first things I want to point out is just having a, <clears throat> a family member or someone in the community that's interested in what and what you're interested in, and then looking for uh, programs to put you in. So to any of the parents that are out listening, just to know you should really uh, take to the internet and look for what they call now STEM programs. That means science, technology, engineering, and math. Mm -hmm. And so you find programs for your child to get into into the summer, and so that then they can have the experience that Dr. Brooker is talking about. Um, I think it's important, too, to just mention, you know, when you have parents, because I also grew up 
with my grandmother and then my mom and neither one of them also went to college and they wouldn't have known to send me to any of those programs. I had never had any of those. I was a big reader though. And because my aunt was a librarian, she would just bring books home and I found myself uh, reading a whole lot, which in the end becomes oh. really important. <laughs> but <laughs> you said something um, that I wanted to uh, talk about and now I lost my train of thought and that's the way Sabrina normally goes. But it anyway, moving on to just being able to you know, critically think. So you said that being in those programs really helped you uh, begin to develop your thinking. And that's one of the things that I really like about science. And I realize it's played a big part in just how I think and how I process things. Right. And so um, one of the things that I find in students uh, nowadays, and even with my own young kids, trying to get them to critically think, to <laughs> see something and think about, you know, really the independent and dependent variables of this and how is this going to be able to, what is that outcome going to be and really walk through things. Because we have the internet, I sometimes think people want information so quickly uh, and so there's no thought behind it. It's just like, oh, I saw this. And that's what, you know, the news or some outlets keep saying, don't listen to everything you, you know, believe everything you see or read or see on social media. So I just wanted to point it out because you said it and I was like, that's what science is for. Yes. And that's what I think, I don't, I don't think I took advantage of that until I finished school. Well, I, I took advantage of knowing that we were using a lot of critical thinking, but I didn't realize everyone else wasn't using it. <laughs> Betty, you just hit yes. me across the head. I, like, I mean, in every field, I just thought, I really assumed I really Everybody assume. thought the same way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really and when you that. start realizing, I'm just like, oh my, oh my God. When you realize that you're really a small number, you're like, okay, okay. okay. And, well. and I mean, so what's funny is sometimes I'm called off for, you know, called out for being over and analytical and overthinker. And I'm like, oh, my bad. Like, I was supposed to stop somewhere, I know, but that's just my bad. And it's not because I'm trying to find some underneath the surface reason why, but I just I want to make sure that we've crossed out every T and dotted every I before right. we make this, you know, final summary. So I think that um, the critical thinking thing is one reason why I probably will recommend kids to always take STEM classes, whether it's math, engineering, science, um, tech, anything, right? Things that let you kind of be um, uh, innovative and also yeah. inquiry-based, something that ha makes you responsible for the output, you know? Right. And I think that that's something that has really been useful. I think in science, we, we take it for granted because we're just like, it's science, we have to think, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that all students should also probably have those classes, especially in college. Don't just go to college and just because you're not a STEM major, not take any of those classes. I know it's so easy not to do, yeah. but I think it's so useful in the end. And I think I wish I, wish I would have taken more classes talking about that now I think I wish I wish I would have taken more classes that maybe it could have been more uh, math classes more physics classes more engineering mm -hmm. classes even mm -hmm. though I wasn't in that I was in biology it just would have been great to have other you know aspects kind of taught to me when I was in undergrad or grad school no and I'm glad we moved to college because that that is something uh, that I realized that is not in um, what they call the gen ed curriculum you don't usually find an engineering class in that and the math is usually for me it was like you know the algebra which you already right. kind of know yeah so it doesn't I will remember um because I went to a math and science school trying to take differential calculus well, that's right you and, I thought you was one of them hmm. yeah <laughs> <laughs> look I tell people I've been a nerd since nerd was a nerd <laughs> I remember this but, I remember taking that course and that's when I think I wasn't even ready to critically think but I don't know that math was just all the way to the left and I was like yeah I'm not gonna be able to do this so I'll come back to you at another time and I left it right where it was but we moved your career on from uh being that little girl uh baking in your windowsill to coming to uh, high school doing your summer programs and now in college and so um I do know that 
you did have a scholarship. And so I really want to, I think this is the part where you really begin to learn the financial STEM career. And so can you tell us a bit about that and uh, tell others who might be listening, maybe parents or students, how they might begin to try and fund a STEM career once they reach college? Yeah, that's a good, good segue. So I think from an early onset of science, my interest in science, I also thought about what were the opportunities for funding. I don't know how that came about, but my aunt, my dear aunt, oh, who okay. was an accounting major, <laughs> so she cared a lot about the money. And so she said that if I went to school, I need to find somewhere somewhere that had this program. And the program at the time was called Minority Access to Research Careers. And mm -hmm. it was through uh, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. And so at this time, I was visiting Grambling State University. And so we had a chance to speak with the Dean of Natural Sciences and my aunt. And to know her is to know that she's about five foot one. And um, she is as formidable as the ever elusive snowman uh, that you may see in the Alps, but she is present, like she is real. Okay. Uh, seriously, she is she five foot one and demeanor of you would think she was a transformer. So she went up to the dean and we're all there. Of course, I'm in high school. I don't know what to ask. I'm just thankful that this guy has time for this little girl, you know. Right, right. Because my niece is only coming here if, if you can guarantee her money and she needs to be able to apply for this program and she needs to get it. And so I said, oh, he's like, well, you know, it's very competitive. So at the time, Mark essentially is a program that funds your undergraduate career. And they also pay you stipends monthly. At this time, in 1999, I started college. The stipend was about $8.52 a month. Oh, now, let me tell you, if we do all of our calculations, that probably would be equivalent to about $3,000 today. <laughs> Oh my goodness. For an undergraduate. <laughs> so, I was like, man, you get $200 a week? What? <laughs> yes. I was like, oh. So, and, uh, but the, the thing about it is you have to be committed to going into graduate bio, bio, biomedical research. Oh it goodness. wasn't for those interested in medical field school, like medical field, pharmacy, dental, anything related to medical professions. It was only for uh, graduate sciences. So you had to be interested in that. Now, of course, they don't, you know, hold you to it, but that's the whole premise because they also want to make sure you're prepared. So they do GRE prep with you. They do make sure you get into these internship programs to help you prepare for those as well. Also keep you, you know, with tutors if you need tutors for different courses and classes throughout your kind of course with this particular fellowship or scholarship program. So mm -hmm. the only thing that I didn't know at the time when I applied for it is that it's only for juniors and seniors. So two of your years, you have to find money to pay for your own school, right? And mm -hmm. so I got academic, academic scholarship from Gramlin um, and I got out of state fee waiver. And so I pretty much maybe had to pay a couple thousand dollars a, a year to go to, to go to undergrad for the first two years. So with that said, apply for the program, but they only have certain slots. So for instance, they only have about four or five slots right. the whole time. So it's competitive. So if they don't graduate, <laughs> you, you can't get a slot. And so I was waiting for these brilliant people to graduate. <laughs> and so I finally got it. I applied for my junior year, got it. And I was so excited about it. And so I was, so, because it's really one of those things where I think only five of us on campus had it. Uh, for the biomedical sciences. And of course, people ended up doing different things. I think maybe I was one of two people at the time that stuck with the science and went on out of the five people that were in, that was in a program with me. And we both went on to get PhDs. One went to Morehouse and I went to UAB. The other three people, of course, and were like medical school, dental school. Right. <laughs> it's always something. It's but it was a good easy. program if you really were interested in science, you know, and I think that was a big, big part of it. They paid, they paid for my tuition full out, and they also gave me money every month. Um, and so my aunt said, I knew you could do it. And I was like, I didn't know that. I'm like, I didn't know I could do it. And I'm like, I felt so much pressure. Um, and But I knew. They are rooting you on. That's a was, great motivator, she right? She was very adamant about if I didn't get it, what was going to happen. I was like, wait, <laughs> I'm trying to make good grades and prove myself. So 
uh, it was a really good experience. And I think that the mentors that I received from that program were really important for me developing, not just as a scientist, but just as an adult and also as a professional. Because a lot of times what, what, some, of us are, what some of us are missing from maybe our you know, first generation households is maybe we don't have as many mentors or um, you know, preceptors that can kind of help us develop different skills, soft skills. Um, also, you know, ha habits and also, you know, just thinking about all the opportunities that we may have in the world, not just limited to being one thing or two things or, you know, a lawyer, doctor, teacher, uh, you know, just those opportunities. And I think that that's something I wasn't aware of because it, while I was a part of the MARC program, I interned at Thomas Jefferson in Philadelphia, the medical center there. And then I also interned at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore as well. And so those were just really helpful for me just to get out and see what was happening and see if I really even like to be in a wet lab, right? You don't mm -hmm. know that until you get, you do labs in, in college and in grad school, but until you get out there and really get hands on and be and responsible for your own experiments and having to present that data, it's a really different thing. So I really appreciated the MARC program for that sponsored by the NIH. So that was a big part of my funding. And then those internships also were very lucrative for undergraduate student. Uh, they also pay you for the internship. So you can't beat that. You know, they pay for your travel, your housing, and they also right. pay you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. one of the things that you said, uh, you brought up, it's just so, this is why I love talking to you, because there are just so many gems in here. First, you know, coming from a first generation household. And so um, I'm also from that same block, you know, no one in my family had um, gone to a four year college. I did have aunts who had done two year and so of course you know I was the first and everybody was proud and like you say you have that weight on your shoulder of I gotta make it because everybody looking and I'm supposed to you know be the one that breaks the mold and in layman's term stops the curse or whatever uh, a family may be thinking you know sometimes people are like oh well yeah. but um saying that coming from that one of the things that you talked about is having mentors in the community um, that <clears throat> you could see because they or you did not see because in our communities all the time, especially if we are from a low income community like myself, I didn't have doctors, lawyers, um, scientists, engineers around me all the time. Now, because I was a student who was, quote unquote, smart, I was always with the smart kids. And then they had parents who were teachers and who were engineers. And so through them, I was able to get that. But in my immediate surrounding, it wasn't there. Uh, and so I was missing those. And so I hear what you're saying, uh, having those programs be able to introduce you to mentors that you would not have come in contact just naturally on your own in your block, your own community. Yeah, and, and that's, then, a word. that's a word, <laughs> definitely not in my block. <laughs> right, because I know my block, no. I know who I would come in contact with. And a lot of good entrepreneurs, but not, <laughs> not necessarily. <laughs> Pharmacists all day, but. All day, honey. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things though, that you mentioned was soft skills, and I, I heard that word and I was like, oh, Yes, because it's one of the things when we work with the Girl Power STEM camp, we hear um, people who come by always say, oh, the girls have such great soft skills. And I don't think people really understand what that is. So if you would expound on what were soft skills to you or what soft skills you kind of gleaned when you were going through these programs. Okay, so I would say some of the soft skills that I probably didn't have and not necessarily because I came from any particular neighborhood. I just think because oftentimes we talk about technical skills and I think we talk about how much we know and um, what type of grades we make, right? And uh, how well we do in the class and all that. But I right. think at the end, we have to be able to interpret that data and inter interpret our skills into something that's usable. And so those soft skills come into play when you're able to interpret and communicate your data and communicate your science, communicate your skills to other people uh, because that makes the world of difference. If you have great science, it means absolutely nothing if it's not effectively communicated. Right. So I think that the soft skills for me were mainly being able to communicate, uh, being confident, 
being able to look people in the eye and speak to them, being able to ask questions when I wasn't sure, uh, and also being able to uh, reply to questions when I was sure. That's something that also came up too a lot of times, especially in grad school, when I did know the answer, but I was so afraid to say the answer. Right. I was not confident. Yeah. Not not that I wasn't confident that I hadn't done do do justice on solving a problem, but just not confident because maybe my I wasn't sure of my peer setting, right? So my soft skills were were essentially things that made me more not just a one force kind of person, but multiple forces in terms of being able to communicate, being able to relate to people, also being able to solve problems and not always having to have the right problem, but just being able to solve problems with others too, right? So it's, it's a lot of things. And I'm saying all this now, and I think we're in the college point, but of course, this is something that I felt that maybe I didn't even have when I graduated from PhD, with my PhD sometimes, that it's, it's a constant growth process that, I, that I've noticed about myself. It's just that I'm constantly picking up from other people and how they deal with problems, how they deal with, with um, answering questions or solving complex situations. And so those soft skills come into part when you realize that you're in a room of, let's say, 10 PhDs ranging from biophysics to bioengineering, and you're trying to figure out where, where, where does your expertise come in and how do you relay that and how is it useful to the team that you're working with? And so I think that that's where my soft skills come in a, a lot more. And that's why I think they're so important as well. Being able to say who you are, enunciate who you are. If you have a name that has a couple of hyphens and a couple of accents that I love, you, you, you enunciate it because I want to be able to say your name the way you say my name, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, and that's something that I, I've encountered a lot working with a lot of different cultures. And I, and I always tell people, hey, tell me your real name. I will say your real name. Uh, you don't have to give me a shortcut because I think that I want to call you what you're, what you're comfortable, being, comfortable being called. Um, I have no nickname. I'm just Betty, right? So I'm always jealous of people outside of BB <laughs> here and there. But I'm like, I like, I like that people have names that, you know, have some, some cultural identity to it. I love that. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think the soft skill thing is probably what has kept me afloat because I don't necessarily think that most times I'm probably not the most brilliant person in the room, but I can relate to people and I can yeah. make it make sense most days. So, and I think that's what the soft skill part that I was referring to is just that a lot of times in science, we're taught to no, no, no. And um, we're not often taught to how to make it relevant, right? And how, why do people care about this? And who, who really cares about it, right? I wouldn't, we wouldn't talk about our conversation probably in a group of, with a group of kindergartners, right? Because at this right. time, we're learning other things. So we have to be com comfortable with our, comfortable with, with our communication skills to relate the information that's, that's necessary for different populations and demographics, I think, but yeah. Yeah, and that, that is just definitely a great, um, point that you make just being able to in my head communicate science what you know to those who might not know it then be in a room full of those who you really believe know way more than you in figuring out where do i fit in this space and what can i offer in this space and i think um uh you said it so eloquently that it's over a period of time, you're still learning. And I, when I heard you say it, I was like, exactly, because I am as well. You know, you continuously picking up, you're continuously figuring out things. But um, one of the things that I always tell my students is that you're higher at higher levels because you can think. You can see the problem and find the solution. Uh, yeah. So I hire you because I know that you can get from step one to step four by yourself. And you may have a question on step five, ask me, but you kind of figured out if that's five, you can get yourself to seven. You know, and I think that's really important when we talk about critical thinking as we talked about it before. And then I also think it's a part of the scientific thinking that we've been kind of trained to do, you know, always looking for how far can I take this, so. Yeah. I think that's a great, great tidbits for your students but keep telling them because that's really useful i mean mm -hmm. I, and i think that that's what a lot of times we're missing when we don't have people who care about our progression past their class right right um a lot of times we don't get those tidbits we're like wait that's like that's a gym that's vitamin i need that you know like
like that's something. I'm gonna hear this podcast because I know they don't think it's a gym. They just be like, oh, Dr. Ross out on her soapbox again. Yes, I am. I'm all the time. <laughs> it's the truth. So you it's, do your best. <laughs> if they don't think it's a gym, it's vitamin. It's everything. Okay, you need hey, girl, it. Look, I'm trying to look help you stay healthy. <laughs> Well, so, look, Betty, um, I know time is just moving along, but I do uh, want to mention, because there was a great commercial out for you, uh, for UNCF, you had the Merck Grad Research Dissertation Fellowship, oh. and I saw that commercial, y'all look, if only you can follow Betty on her social media. <laughs> It'd be lit, and I'd be lit too, like, look at Betty, because oh, to me, you are such the... Um, Post the child almost for Black Girl Magic in the Science Lab. I just be want to put up a post of you and be like, she doing it all. Just ask me. And I'm I'll so say. inappropriate most days, though. Please believe that. <laughs> my, the, and the ideas and information on my page are my own. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, because I think that oftentimes people don't know people like you, right? You know, and I realized when I came back home to California, so many people would ask me, the main question I would always get was, how did you get into science? And I thought that was just such a bizarre question because at UAB, when we were at UAB together, I don't know if I should say that. <laughs> you know, we, we were. No, <laughs> and, we were. Um, I did not realize that I was so um, lucky and so blessed to have so many Black women who were going through the same kind of uh, program with me, even though you, you know, you graduated kind of um, a couple years after I got there, but um just going through processes with me, right? And being able to see how they worked, how I worked. I think that's something that I didn't take advantage of as much as I think I should have. Because now, of course, and I hate to, I hate when people say that I'm the only one, but it, it, it becomes yeah. that, you know, yeah. because now we're sprouting out to different companies, different academic institutions. And we're not gonna always have, you know, five or six girls that look like us, that can, you know, mirror us who are working on similar topics or similar de- in similar departments that we can, you know, just be homegirls with, you know, we love science, yeah. but we also still homegirls. So I think that's something that I would definitely say is a big part of my success at UAB was because I had such a beautiful community there and, um, mm-hmm. you know, growth, growth through the growth at UAB with those people as well. Yeah. And it's funny that you said that because, it just seems like UAB just had this um, umbrella. Well, they did. They had the CMFSDP, which was the, that's the fellowship I had. So oh, I didn't know that. Okay, okay. Right. So it was like a minority fellowship for uh, students seeking doctorate degrees. Oh. It was in the office of Dr. Lewis Dale. I remember him, but I didn't, you know, okay, so. Yeah, it was a lot of different umbrellas. You're right, you're right. Okay. Right, so when that when I came in, I came in with a group, and before me was Carita Ambrose and Ashala McGee. I don't know if you remember. They were in Dr. Yoder's lab. So for those who are listening, I know me and Betty have taken this conversation all the way to the left. We were back in graduate school talking to each other. But we're just showing how, you know, it makes a difference. Representation matters. And it's because I saw those two young women over in the microbiology, uh, the biomedical research, what was y'all lab over there? But they're the ones who I would go to and talk with and try and emulate because I saw what they were doing. And so just to see that then you came along after me and saw me and was like, yeah. hey, I'm trying to do what she's doing and, you know, have that group. Like, mama, it's so, the black girl here. I know, right? <laughs> Look, in my class, there were three. It was me, Charlotte, and Delicia. I was like, oh, I got my girlfriends. Here we go. Look, we were destiny child in the lab. What? <laughs> you need, I think you need that. I mean, I don't think I would have been as comfortable if I didn't have somebody to reflect something off of. You whether are. It was, um, you know, environment environmental similarities or or racial similarities something i needed somebody that i could just you know shoot it with like hey right. and that's exactly how i was i know uh for me charlotte and i became like end up being best friends and we became study partners because i had somebody who i could and could study like me and yeah. would be up at all crazy hours of the night <laughs> here's another one yeah i mean i think and i just wish i would have taken advantage of that a little bit more you know just the different types of people we have even though we're saying you know from the same 
racial class, but we all were different too, right? We right. all came to love science in a different different way. And I think that was the really cool thing about it. Um, yeah, it's scary though. It's scary that now that I'm, you know, a professional and people still ask that question. That's why I think it's so important to have, you know, platforms like this, of course, but also all the work that you do with the STEM lab and all the work you do with the girls, you know, I think I spoke one time to them a couple summers ago, yeah. but all that work. I mean, that's like, we need that because it still seems like it's not hitting enough, you know, people who look like us and who, and I'm not going to say that they're not interested in it. I just think exposure, right? It is. I think about me, I probably wouldn't have been as interested in, in it if I didn't have exposure in those camps earlier on. And that's why we continue to work. Well, as we segue to our third segment, and you just really eloquently put us there, uh, it's the wisdom. And so this is what I want to ask you. If you could speak to yourself at any age, what advice would you give yourself to stay on the path of a STEM career? We've talked about, you know, all of the help that I do with the young girls in STEM. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm trying to catch girls at a young age. So if you take a moment and just look back in your span, what would you say to yourself? So I would say uh, as an undergraduate, I would have told myself to take as many classes as possible. Uh, branch out. Don't just stay focused on biology, but, you know, branch out into other things as well. Mm -hmm. Could have been a business class or whatever, or an engineering class, especially. Just th different things. Um, don't always try to go for the top marks. Go for top retention more so of what you really are interested in. Because I think that was, I don't know if this is pushed at your school, but I feel like at my school, I went to a state school. So of course they want you to make good grades. They want you to, you know, be top of the class. But I, I feel like sometimes that's all I was doing was making good grades, but I really wasn't understanding why these things were important until I got to grad school. So in undergrad, I would say, uh, diversify your curriculum. I would say that. Grad school, I would say, ask more questions. Even if it hurts, ask more questions. I was essentially a mute in my classes in grad school. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I was a mute, and I think I mentioned this earlier, it wasn't because I didn't know or because I wasn't familiar. It was just, I just wasn't confident enough yeah. to ask questions in front of, you know, I think it was like 40 or 50 people in those classes with us. Right. And, you know, they're, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And so they're different. And, um, you know, just, they just, they weren't the people that I would, go have drinks with on a Friday afternoon, right? Right. So I wasn't comfortable, but I realized now that was a time to ask a lot of questions. We, you know, someone was given their time. These experts were given their time and their opinions about a subject matter. That was a time to ask a lot of questions instead of going, you know, back to my lab and really pondering like, oh my gosh, did I ask this right? Did, did, is this the right thing? Or yes. So I think a lot of that could have been probably helped with just being more confident. And I think that because I came from an HBCU as well, um, I, I was definitely ready for the courses, but I don't know if I was confident about my training and I should have been, I mean, to be honest, I should have been. Um, because I think that my training prepared me to where I got to, right? It prepared me to be in grad school with all these other, you know, prepared, well-prepared students but I still think my, again, soft skills probably were not up to par. And because some people were super confident, regardless of what type of training they had, and they asked a lot of questions. And <laughs> in my head, sometimes I'll be like, what the heck is that? <laughs> and so um, I just think that's one of the things that I look back on now. I just wish I would have asked more questions, even if I felt like, you know, I may have been ridiculed or laughed at. I ask more questions because you're not the only one with that question in your head. That's something that I realized too, is that most times when you have a question, somebody else has that same question. They're also probably fearful to ask that question. Um, so I think that was really important uh, to, to you know diversify your curriculum, ask more questions in grad school, and postdoc, um, be realistic. 
Um, oh, okay. Be realistic. And so my biggest dream was to be a college professor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, so my biggest dream, I always love working with students. I love energy from students. Um, but I think that being realistic kind of taught me as well was that, hey, I, I may not be able to directly teach kids or teach students every day in a university setting, but that doesn't have to cut off my interaction with students or my interaction with mentoring. Yeah. And so I think that when I say be realistic, I live in an area where there are a couple of, you know, UABs or, you know, medical schools. So out of that couple, you know, the competition is very high. And did I, was that really my goal or was my goal honestly to just always be, have my foot in the community somewhere? And I think when I started being more realistic in my postdoc, I said, hey, I do want to work. I do want to be in science, but what can I, how can I be useful in science, even if I'm not in an academic setting? And so that was something that weighed heavily on me because we come from, you know, a university that puts out really top people and they all get academic right. positions. <laughs> and here I was finishing a postdoc and I was not looking for an academic position. And so I think that um, when I look back on things, I was like, okay, but Betty, you have to be realistic with, you know, your retention, you, the retention rate for here for, you know, California is everyone wants to stay in the same place. You don't want to move. So right. what are my options? And also like, what, what are your real goals? Is your goal just to have a title? Cause sometimes I get, you know, I do get caught up sometimes like, wait, 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 I want to be at the university level, hanging out, doing curriculum based, you know, inquiry based stuff, mm -hmm. having fun with the girls, <laughs> you know, on these group chats. But I also thought like, Hey, um, my science can, my science can be just as cool, but maybe I won't be the, you know, the principal investigator. And I mean, that's just something that comes with a lot of humility. I think a lot of times, and I say, I keep saying, because we were taught that I feel like at, you know, UAB, we come from old school, you know, science, old school thought of, you know, here are your steps. This is what you need to do to get, get there. And if you can't get there, why, what is the reason why? You but, know, it's, just hearing you talk and I'm like, oh, you know, I saw Betty's trajectory so differently because for me, it was like, oh, Betty's a risk taker because you're right. You know, we were trying to be yeah. academic <laughs> and when, you know, you were in an academic position, you was like, no, I'm going to this round. I was like, oh, she gave it up. She's going where? She's doing what? And so, you know, in the back of my mind, because, you know, like my little sister, I'm screaming and fearing for you. It's like, what is Betty going to do? And then just to see, and then when things came the way, came full circle like they did, I was like, Betty, I knew all along. I should have followed Betty. You know, she's where it's at. You know, because no. I can't say being in academia is always, you know, it's bed of roses. But um, I just saw you as a risk taker and really doing your own thing, you know, so on the line of what I think of millennials at this time, uh, them charting their own course and really doing things in an untraditional, non-traditional, unconventional way. Right. And so I think uh, I really like your story because it shows that you don't have to go on that traditional path that right. everybody thinks you should, that, you know, there are so many different paths, just choose one and go with it. And I'm glad to see that you realize that, you know, I want to be in the community and you are, I see you all the time. You're still doing so much in the community, but you're also, you know, found your path of science and how you want it to make your own difference. So. And I think well, that was important to me. So I, I think that, Oh, you know, I think you probably feel the same way. It's just finding something that you really are passionate about, right? And just right. sticking to it. I think that was the, the biggest, the bigger thing, but also not letting people down who have been in my corner for so long, right? Like yeah. your PIs and, you know, all those people that put a lot of, a lot of time into me too. So I think that was one of the things. And so I, um, I'm really appreciative that, you know, as scientists, you can move around. You can't do, you can't do different things. You're, and the, and the best thing about being a scientist, STEM, for all the upcoming STEM ladies and, and, and gentlemen, is that when you're a scientist, you can go and do anything and learn how to do anything. Any girl, tell it, yes. I, 
I work with scientists who are now like marketers, who are now product management people, who are now like over operations. And I'm like, how did you, oh, got it, got it, you know? It's like at our company, we have essentially PhD people doing things that I never knew PhDs could do, but they do it so well. Yeah. yeah. And so, that's, it's wonderful to know that your degree can move you or your scientific interest can move you along yeah a myriad of ways like the pathway is not straight usually you know they call it the steam pipeline and i always think oh, people never rem tell people that there are offshoots on the pipeline right and so you can go to various places it all doesn't lead down the street to the university so exactly exactly and I, and i think that um all of us aren't you know i think the, the number of positions that are at universities too you know it's changed compared to what it was in the 80s and 90s right and right. i think that we need both but we also just need to make sure that we support both too, right? That's just I'm like, hey, academic stuff is really important. If these kids don't learn what they need to learn, they can't come out and be productive, you know, okay. later on in, in, the, in the world. So I think both are super, super important. And, and I, I think that now a lot of our older PIs probably realize that the traditional route just isn't so tra traditional anymore, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Booker, I am going to say thank you so oh, much. I mean- thank you. Girl, it's, it's been so great to talk to you. I haven't talked to you in a long time. I just follow you, apparently. I <laughs> know, I know. We need to catch up more. <laughs> I, know, and I, I, I despise social media because of that. Let me say that. I despise. Because then you feel like you know what's happening in people's lives. <laughs> Don't reach out. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I'm that like, is I'm so true. Well, I'm what bad. I do love is that anytime I reach out to you, you're always just so happy to help me out and it has just been a pleasure to have you as our first guest on the stem lab podcast Thank you. <laughs> and we are hoping to um eventually have a panel when it comes to our march and women's history month so we'll bring you back uh to revisit some things with a whole another panel of women is there anything else any last uh tidbits that you haven't thought of anything that should our lab mates follow you on anything or go to any website? Yes, of course. Yes. Us, uh, us Generation X people, we don't know even our, our handles. Um, I know. We always have to have something. It's like, oh, I'm doing this exciting thing here. There are other. <laughs> so. so you can follow me on Instagram at bb underscore love 19 b-e-e -E, b-e-e -E, underscore love 19 that's on instagram that's probably my most um active site <laughs> so you can follow me there i have a lot of inappropriate stuff that has absolutely nothing to do with science <laughs> well i love it because that's what i want people to see because i know you know we are women in stem but we have lives we are three-dimensional and that's what i wanted folks to realize so thank you once again for uh, you, Mr. Walker. your time and we hope that we'll talk to you soon. Okay, thank you.